I'm your host, Annie Bowles, and this is News Du Jour. Hey everyone, and welcome back to the News Du Jour. Happy Thursday. Ooh, what a week. I don't know about you guys, but this week is flying past. I've never been busier, but it's making the days go by in a complete, messy, fast blur. Anyway, we have a number of stories today that require content warning, so I just wanted to give you guys that heads up at the top because there's a lot. But our first content warning um, for our first story is involving the death of a minor. So a Mississippi teenager has been shot and killed by police. Jaheim McMillan, a black 15-year-old boy, was shot in the head and killed by police in Gulfport, Mississippi, outside of a discount store. He was only a freshman in high school, you guys. When his mom arrived on the scene, she was actually handcuffed and escorted across the street. The police are claiming that they responded to a call about motorists, quote unquote, I assume they mean someone driving a car, waving guns at other motorists. They claimed that McMillan was armed when they shot him, but the family does not believe this claim and they are calling for the release of body camera footage and or dashboard footage of the encounter to prove that their son had been armed when the police confronted and killed him. And as we know from the Breonna Taylor case, uh, these families oftentimes are correct in their hunch about law enforcement. So uh, let's hope that they can, you know, provide the body camera footage to, you know, for sure say yes or no about whether he was armed when he was shot. Bizarrely, The police also handcuffed the teen after they had shot him when he was laying on the ground, bleeding in front of the store. They decided to handcuff him. He was shot in the head. Doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. The Mississippi Bureau of Investigation has announced that they are officially looking into this incident and will be conducting a formal investigation. He was transported to the hospital after being shot and actually lived there for several days, but ultimately had to be taken off life support. The autopsy was scheduled to have happened yesterday, but no additional details have been released at this time. So stay tuned. If we get more on this story, we'll be sure to let you know. So as I mentioned before, I need to go ahead and issue a content warning on this story as well. This story is going to discuss sexual abuse allegations. So women's soccer is unraveling a vast web of abuse, you guys. And it feels like these days, if you look close enough at any women's sport, you will find abuse at the hands of male coaches, trainers, and medics. It's scary and it's sad and it makes you wonder, what will it take to keep athletics safe, you guys? It seems that yet again, just like we're seeing in gymnastics and cheer, reports going back years had been ignored and piling up just collecting dust. Here are some examples of what went down. Reportedly, one coach called a player in to go over tapes of their game and showed her pornography instead. Another coach was asking players for detailed information about their sex lives, 
after essentially bullying them about their performance. And that set them up to feel like they had to answer his questions because he was upset with them. Another coach coerced the young female players into sexual acts and was fired for this by one team, but quickly hired by another top team. And that's when the original team wished him luck publicly via social media. Like what? You didn't think to warn the other team and protect those young women? Verbal and emotional abuse was also extremely prevalent, the investigation found. So players eventually refused to take the field due to the vast system of abuse that was being uncovered in this report. Really, it seemed like it just got to the point where the owners of the teams and the governing bodies of the sport were just too intimidated by these coaches to take any action. Paralyzed, the coaches ended up kind of running the show and taking advantage of not only the vulnerable players themselves, but of the sport and the league as a whole. They kind of ran rampant and preyed on these women in many different ways on many different teams. Both executives and coaches have resigned or were fired after the investigation's report came out. About half of the league's coaches were revealed to have been abusive when the report came out. And the players finally felt free to come forward with their stories. But the report made recommendations for safeguarding players going forward. But rules and guidelines are only helpful if they are enforced. Because if you don't enforce the rules, why have the rules? They don't mean anything if they're not enforced. And I bet they had some types of rules in place when this was going down. And right, they they didn't enforce them. So let's hope they can take those steps to create better rules and work together to stand up against predators going forward. And last but not least, Hunter Biden in trouble Again, So I want to give you guys a little backstory to all of the Hunter Biden drama because I don't know if you guys know really the history of the Biden family and Hunter specifically. Um, He's pretty problematic. So I thought we would kind of take a deeper look at who he is as a person and the Biden family's story. So let's jump in. First and foremost, it's important, and you may already know this, but President Biden is no stranger to grief and loss, you guys. He lost a young wife in a car accident along with his daughter, young daughter, Naomi, back in 1972. Both of his boys, Bo and Hunter, were also injured in the car accident, but they survived. Biden was sworn in as a senator shortly after this, and this crash was around Christmas. They were going Christmas shopping, and a truck just rammed into their car. Bo ended up being kind of this golden boy of sorts. He went to Penn, he was a lawyer, he served in the military, and he had a flourishing political career, serving as the Attorney General of Delaware. But he got sick, and in 2015, he succumbed to a brain tumor, probably linked to his time serving in Kosovo. So now, in the story, President Biden has lost a son, a daughter, and a wife. And Bo died as that kind of golden son. And as much as he was a golden boy, Hunter is kind of his problematic counterpart. So Hunter Biden has been in a lot of trouble in the past. He has struggled with a drug addiction, cocaine. He has been in and out of rehab throughout Biden's political career. He was discharged from the military due to his drug use. He's gotten divorced. He has been accused of soliciting prostitutes and frequenting strip clubs, and he even had a daughter via an erotic dancer from one of these clubs. 
He briefly dated Bo's wife after Bo passed away. He then turned around and married a woman that he'd only known for six days. He has been investigated for tax crimes since 2018. And obviously, President Trump was pretty convinced that Hunter had some type of shady business dealings in Ukraine. Trying to get dirt on Hunter was actually the reasoning behind Trump's first impeachment. If you guys remember, we covered that extensively. So if you're an OG listener to News Du Jour, you will remember us breaking that down. And that's where all that hullabaloo behind Hunter's laptop comes in. Trump and his followers believe that there is evidence of financial crimes on that laptop, and there very well may be. At this time, though, it seems that Hunter Biden may have forged some information in order to obtain a gun, making it illegal. Again, President Biden is standing by him, but let's face it, It would really be a bad look for a president who champions harsher gun regulations to have a son who cannot seem to abide by the very minimal existing rules. It sounds like the quote unquote lie on his firearm application had to do with him checking no when it asked if you use drugs. Hunter was sober at the time of this application. He has been for a few years now. But he does have a history with drug use. So this kind of becomes murky water. Since this went down in Delaware, Attorney General Merrick Garland has decided to put the decision of whether or not to charge Hunter in the hands of the Attorney General of Delaware. That way it's not sort of caught up in the web of the White House. This is a position, though, ironically, that Bo once held. President Biden spoke out on this subject, saying, quote, I have great confidence in my son. I love him, and he's on the straight and narrow, and he has been for a couple years now. I'm just so proud of him, end quote. So, like I said before, he is really standing by Hunter in this moment, and he always, always has. Hunter actually put out a memoir about his life and he describes a moment with his father where his father was holding him just weeping saying, I don't know what to do, son. Tell me what to do. Tell me what to do. And he was just so afraid that he was going to lose Hunter too. And it's just so heartbreaking as a parent to think about that moment and what that would be like to know that your kid was in the throes of a drug addiction and possibly going to lose their life to it. So what is around the corner for Hunter Biden? We can't say. We can only wait and see. But at the end of the day, if they investigate and find that he hasn't been using drugs, then maybe checking no on that wasn't a lie. I think that's what things really hinge on as of right now, but we'll see where the Attorney General of Delaware decides to take things. Stay tuned. And that is the news du jour. Today, I wanted to leave you guys with the quote, you've got to go out on a limb sometimes because that is where all the fruit is. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider becoming a patron of our podcast. For $7.99 a month, you can unlock tons of perks like breaking news text messages so that you're never out of the loop. Tons of bonus episodes are already up there ready for you to binge and a discussion board full of networking opportunities and much more. Go to www.patreon.com forward slash sugarfree media today to become a patron. This is the best way to support our show. Our patrons make news du jour possible. But a couple other ways to support our podcast are rate and review on whatever podcast platform you use to listen, share on your social media, you have influence. Tell your friends, family, and colleagues that you love news du jour and why you listen. You can also follow us on social media under sugarfreemedia.co on Instagram, 
Just sugar-free media, all one word on TikTok and sugar-free underscore media on Twitter. We also have a weekend newsletter called Dreamers Digest that's full of dreamy content recommendations for your weekend and a life update from yours truly. Sign up today on our website, www.sugarfreemedia.co. Our music is by Joey Lavoy and Nicholas Foster. Our cover art is by Hannah Pierce Photography. Our Sugar Free Media logo is by Katherine Jezik Designs. Any twinkling or little footsteps you might hear in the background are by my dog, Rhett. He's a rescue pup and always records with me. We appreciate you listening and look forward to telling you about the news again next time on News Du Jour. Broadcasting from Oh, oh.